Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone, glad to have you. If this is your first time, uh, you're in the right place. Uh, this is the Tritium Talk series. Um, we will later show you how you can see this recording uh, at a later date, read to rewatch. Uh, and, and in addition, uh, if you've missed some of the earlier ones, they all are on the website and we'll show you how to be able to tune into all of these. Uh, today is a 411 feature sneak peek, and we will be covering the archive alarm provider. With me today is Ashatosh Chaturvedi, and as always, Blake Puhak to provide us some assistance with the Q&A. Let's get started. So we'll kick it off. Um, with a, uh, a little uh, background about what's new with Niagara and, and where we are with the uh, current release. Um, right now, uh, the, the latest release is 410U1 and is now available. Uh, as some may or may not know, 410 is earmarked the long-term supported release. And as such, we will always uh, do our best to provide security um, enhancements, and updates in the form of an update build uh, to ensure uh, all the sites out there running the long-term support or release are the most secure. Uh, so this, this slide is actually from the 410 features review showing all the features that came in 410, but I have highlighted um, some of the additions to 410U1. So we have the security uh, critical support and enhancements and in addition to that, we filed and uh, worked towards getting a BTL listing um, for that version specifically on both a uh, supervisor installation, JS8000, and an Edge 10. And coming up soon, hence the feature introduction, is 4.11. We are in a current beta program right now. Uh, we have a handful of sites. Um, running 4.11 out, out there in the field, uh, actual production sites, and we're getting great feedback uh, trying to uh, assess, um, you know, are the features well received? And then in addition, have, you know, has there been any regression or any bugs we don't know about? And we'll, we'll continue to work through that process. And when we're, once we're completed, we'll finally release. So let's talk about 4.11. Uh, as I mentioned, you'll be able to go back to some of the other uh, feature presentations. Um, today, we're covering the archive alarm provider, but here's a glimpse at all the features that are coming in 4.11, uh, which uh, we so far have done a BACnet Secure Connect Tritium Talk, as well as the archive history provider Tritium Talk. But today we'll focus on archive alarm provider. So what is the archive alarm provider? So I've, I'd like to take a step back and just kind of review uh, how we do alarm management and how the alarm space works in Niagara. So a lot on the page here, but we'll, I'll walk you through it. Starting at the top left, here's a, a small snapshot of a station that is running on a JACE. And you simply could have any kind of numeric writable, for example, and you add an alarm extension to it. It's the alarm extension that's monitoring the condition uh, you're you know, wanting to uh, alert the user to. Once that condition is met, it's the alarm service that then is gonna generate this alarm record and access the local alarm database in the station. Now this is a, a native Niagara alarm database. This is a, a Niagara DB. And you have, a, a, you know, you could have several points constantly populating um, this alarm database. And at any given time, if you want to see what's currently happening in the database, you have the database view. And that's up at the top right. That is a view of the alarm service component itself. Now you, you can't do much in that view other than see everything. It's, it's not the way the user interacts with the alarm. The way a user interacts with the alarm is through a console recipient. And you can tie alarm classes to a given console recipient 
And that's how a user can interact with the alarm database. And when I mean interact, I mean they can acknowledge an alarm that I've, I've seen this come in. I, I know it's a problem and I'd like to acknowledge that I've seen it and now I'm gonna go take care of it. And when you acknowledge an alarm, uh, it, it, if the condition is still in alarm, it will, it'll reside there on the console recipient waiting for you to address the problem. So now you run out, you fix the valve, fix uh, you know, uh, whatever the space temperature problem was, uh, and now it's out of alarm, you can, this is configurable, but now you can come back to the console recipient and acknowledge uh, this is no longer in alarm and it will remove itself from the console recipient uh, however, it always resides in the database view. The database view is the way to be able to go back in, you know, if you're at a later date, you need to go back and say, hey, when was it I had, uh, I, I had to fix that valve? I go back to the database view to see the, the old records. So the console recipient is more of the workspace for the end user, whereas the database view is more of the, hey, I need to go research when, when this particular activity ha happened. And now let's talk about some of the problems or the shortcomings with, with just this layout. And, and they're not necessarily bad things. It's all about making sure uh, the application or the, or the layout here meets your customer's needs. Um, one shortcoming is storage. If you're just running this on a JACE, you have some limited space. And if a, a end user has lots of things that go in alarm, and they'd like to collect it for years because they have to keep good records, you're not going to get very far trying to store everything on a JACE. At some point, instead of letting the drive fill up, it has to start deleting the old records as new records come in. Uh, a second shortcoming or problem is if you only had a, a, a JACE station set up and then you had several JACEs, uh, your end user has to sit there and log into each JACE at any given time and, and be looking at all these console recipients that are in the individual JACE stations. And that could be confusing because you can't really look unless you have three screens. You still have to be constantly monitoring three screens. It would be nice if there was a single location that you could see everything. So let's talk about the sort of the, you know, the next level up, uh, we introduce a supervisor. Um, and this concept is applied to many of the foundational concepts of Niagara. If you have a supervisor station that all these JACEs feed into, you can now set up your station in the JACE to route to the supervisor. And, and by route, I mean route all the alarms uh, that are getting triggered up to the supervisor. So on the left-hand side, this is still the JACE station, but we've we have a supervisor in the Niagara network, and then we have a station recipient component under the alarm service. And you're telling the alarm service that as, as the alarm service of that station manages alarms, I want you to route to uh, this particular station. And in this scenario, I've selected the supervisor station. And so it uses the Niagara network to pass that information along up to the supervisor. And so the picture in the middle is going to show you uh, multiple JSEs residing under a supervisor station, JSE 1, 2, and 3. And now if, if you had set up each of those JSEs to route to the supervisor, you can now view the single console recipient in that supervisor station and view all the alarms that are coming in. And so on the right-hand side, our, our now relieved end user, he just has one console recipient that's viewing that local alarm database, it's still a Niagara native database, to, uh, to browse his entire system's uh, alarm records and, uh, and you know, manage them with acknowledgments, uh, making notes and, and any other offerings, uh, uh, enhancements that one might provide. So again, let's, let's consider some of the shortcomings of the problems here. Uh, you could still have a, a storage problem. Um, your supervisor is on a PC. It's likely you have a very large hard drive and can store uh, without much problem um, or, or add to the hard drive or upgrade the hard drive without much issue. Um, however, one, one problem that can happen uh, 
you can start to get a performance hit when you start to get one too many alarms. Um, if you start to notice, uh, I try to view the database and it's trying to query, you know, uh, a quarter of a million records and it's it's like, wow, this really runs slow or the station startup slow and you see it, it hangs on the alarm service trying to get that up and running. It's likely you're, you're not you could tune this a little bit better so, such that you, you don't have that many alarms sitting in your alarm database. Another potential shortcoming is a redundancy requirement. On the supervisor, that's sitting on one PC host and that's where the alarms are. And you may have some reason or condition that uh, you need to have a secondary location that these alarms are stored. It may just be a requirement. There, there is an FDA approval uh, that, that has that requirement among many others. Um, and it may just be part of a specification that they say it's the alarms that we have to keep a close eye on and have to have records for a very long time. So it can't reside on just one host. We need it to be elsewhere. So let's focus on uh, one, one level up again. From the supervisor, you could route these alarms and have them stored in a remote database. And now what that's is allowing you to do is uh, one, one requirement is, well, now I've got it off of the machine that's actually populating the alarms. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it, in Niagara, uh, we utilize the RDBMS driver, which will enable you to connect to an RDB, a relational database, and store the alarms there. And that has some advantages uh, past the things I've already covered. There, there may be reasons why you need it in an RDB environment. Maybe you have applications that work against an RDB. Uh, just you, your customers more comfortable with you know, the query languages of a given RDB and really enjoy is just being able to look things up, um, you know, once these alarms are, you know, are stored and they say, oh, I got to go back to all of last year and see when uh, a valve broke and, and, you know, when this condition happened. And, and so they like the idea that it's sitting in an RDB. And so the way that works in Niagara, uh, we have a, a, a component in the middle here called the Orion service. And to simplify it, think of it as sort of a, uh, a translator of databases. And so the Orion alarm service will leverage that Orion services ability to uh, funnel the alarms and pass them over to a remote database. So you have two requirements here. Your, your supervisor station has to, um, uh, it has to have been purchased with uh, an RDB BMS network driver. Uh, so that you can communicate to an RDB. And then second, you have to add the Orion service and you're no longer using the native uh, Niagara alarm service, you are using the Orion alarm service. Those are two very different services, um, different code behind each of them. But once you've modified your station as such, you can now uh, have all, just like before, all of your alarms, routed to the supervisor, and now they're being stored in an RDB. Now, if I need to look at the database view, the entire database, this is not a console, this is a, I need to go back and look at all the records. The top right shows you uh, the database view of the Orion alarm service component. And so you're actually similar to the alarm service, but you're viewing uh, the view on, a, on this different component and the alarm service is no longer, the original alarm service is no longer in the station because there's only the Orion alarm service. And then of course the console recipient um, to, to view and, and manage the alarms. But now keep this in mind, when you go to pull up these views, uh, you're no longer just connecting to the station. There is now a dependency between the station and this RDB. And so the, the RDB network is a connection between the station and that remote alarm database, so that RDB. And if that, if that connection drops, right now there isn't, the, there isn't any kind of handling of if alarms keep coming in, um, you know, do they just queue up and then go to the RDB? 
they, unfortunately they don't, they will just be lost. And so you, you have this network dependency in addition to the uh, host dependency, the host um, that is uh, running the RDB, if, if that just fails, uh, you no longer are uh, collecting these alarms into a database. And so that's a pretty big problem or shortcoming um, given a scenario where you're trying to put something in a remote database. So what did we do about it? What did we come up with to solve this problem? And that's where we introduced the archive alarm provider. Uh, to take a, a little pause here, we're gonna get into a little bit of a um, kind of direct, we're gonna direct this towards the developer community that's in the audience today. Uh, we'll talk about the abstract class that we've created. So this is this is part of the public API. It's an abstract class called B Archive Alarm Provider. And this abstract class is the uh, sort of architecture to help you create your own implementation of a B Archive Alarm Provider. And so what this will do for you is you are you are accessing at the alarm level, the alarm service, and you're, you're giving it the ability to archive a closed alarm to a remote database for historical storage. What do I mean by that? I mentioned before how you would have the console recipient, you acknowledge, you go fix the valve, you come back, you acknowledge that um, this is all taken care of, that alarm is closed and it should sit in the database view. Um, in, in the local uh, Niagara alarm station. But now we can set it up to execute or trigger at a given interval, so maybe middle of the night, 2 a.m., to take the alarms that are there in the Niagara station alarm database and send them, because we, we're no longer really concerned with them, that we just still need to keep them in storage. We can now send them uh, to a remote database. And so the concept is you have this abstract class that now allows you to create this provider to, to point the alarm service to a remote database. So in the pictures here, um, well, I'm gonna kind of review it one more time. We have uh, the, the upper left, we have the alarm ser service database view. We have the a bottom left is the console recipient. And then over on the right is some remote storage of some kind that we uh, would like to store these alarms. So an alarm comes in and the end user at the console recipient will acknowledge, uh, he'll fix the valve, he'll come back, he'll acknowledge. It's now closed and sitting in the database view. And now we could set up this provider that we've created to maybe execute in the middle of the night and say, hey, go take all these alarms and send them off to this remote storage. And so when that trigger happens, they will no longer show up in the database view on the left-hand side. You'll only find them on the database view of the right-hand side. And what we've provided are the same similar views. So you can actually still see both of these locations in Niagara with, this, with the same views, a database view or um, uh, the, the maintenance view, if you still want to clear alarms. Um, but what this allows you now is to keep the alarm, uh, the Niagara Station alarm database uh, tidy, if you will, by uh, remotely uh, sending off, or rather, excuse me, sending off the closed alarms to a, a remote location. And now they can be stored for safekeeping for large number of year, um, and we'll show you in a minute uh, how, since this is an abstract class, this isn't really a tangible thing added uh, to your station at this point, but we'll show you in a minute um, how we've provided this with some of the current existing implementation. But the idea is we, we have it tied to an RDB network connection. So our implementation uh, to provide something right out of the box was to enhance the um, the Orion, uh, the usage of the Orion service by creating an Orion alarm, excuse me, archive alarm provider. And so if I, now that I've created this provider, 
I'm still using, so on the left-hand side, we have a, a station configuration. I'm still using the native Niagara alarm service. So this is not the Orion alarm service. This is the Niagara alarm service. I am required to have the Orion service because I will be uh, sending these to an RDB. Hence, below you see an RDBMS network and a MySQL database, which is where I have told the provider, the Orion Archive Alarm provider, to archive my uh, Niagara alarms that are closed on a on some kind of interval, on some kind of uh, schedule that that meets my customers' needs. And so, on the right hand side, you could see. Um, the property sheet of the Orion Archive Alarm Provider. There's some similar uh, uh, slots here with execution time and retry triggers. Um, so there's a kind of a, it should be a familiar concept with uh, say history archiving from a JACE to a supervisor. You, you run it uh, and, and let it collect maybe for the day. And then once, once a day, 2 a.m., you send them all up somewhere. And so in, in a similar vein, you will be uh, allowing your end user to to manage the alarms locally here in Niagara, and then at 2 a.m. or at whatever is convenient to your customer. Send them off to a remote location, and we're leveraging the Orion service to, in, in, our, in our instance, in the Orion Archive Alarm Provider, we're leveraging the uh, Orion service to send this off to an RDB. So that, that was a lot, but I, want, I really wanted to kind of lay out or do a, a strong introduction here so you understand the existing um, offerings and then how this is uh, different than what's there now. And, uh, and now uh, Ashitosh is going to demo um, how you would set this up and some of the different views and scenarios that you might have uh, when you using the Orion Archive Alarm Provider. So without further ado, I will let Ashitosh take it away. Thank you, Chris. So this would be a two-part demo. In the first part, I'll be showing how to do, do the setup and working of the provider. And in the second part, we'll, show, we'll see how we can migrate an existing system using Alarm Orion to a system which uses Alarm service along with the provider. So I'll share my screen. Here we have a demonstration with alarm service and a console a recipient with it. And uh, also as a prerequisite, we have a RDMS network which has SQL Server database configured under it. The Orion archive alarm provider is present under the alarm Orion palette. We can directly drag and drop it under the alarm service. When we open the provider for the first time, it goes to the property sheet of the provider. And by default, it's disabled. We have to enable it first. The existing Niagara users will recognize that the provider is a descriptor which has the execution time, which can be configured based on what trigger level we want. We can trigger it to execute the action or the export of the closed uh, alarms, depending on our choice. We also need to set the RDB ORD, similar to what we had for alarm service. So I'll set this to our existing SQL Server database. Once the setup is ready, we need to quickly restart the system for the changes to take place. So my station is up now. Now, if we see, there are a few changes. First, the default view on the provider is changed to database maintenance view. 
if we go into the view, we can see that the views are consistent with the alarm service. We have the database maintenance view, alarm DB view, and the corresponding AX views. Currently, we do not have any closed alarms in it. Similarly, if we see at the top of the station under the alarm space, we have alarm archive space. So alarm space will show all the alarms under the uh, open alarm space and the alarm archive will show all the alarms which are closed or which are processed by the provider. We still have the same views across alarm and alarm archive space with the similar functionality available such as adding notes or clearing them out. So let's quickly see how we can use the provider. I have a few alarm points here. I'll trigger them to go in an alarm state. Let's move this here. So I have a bunch of alarms in active speed state, I can kind of inactivate them. So if I see here in the console recipient, I have a bunch of alarms and uh, in my provider, it is still clear. Similarly, if I go to alarm service and the view of it, the database maintenance view, I have all the active alarms here. Now I need to first close them to clear them out and archive them in the database. So I'll select a bunch of open alarms, acknowledge them. That will clear them from the console recipient. If I go back to the alarm service and refresh the view, I can see it's a mix of alarms which are uh, open and a mix of alarms which is closed already. The provider still does not have those alarms yet. So to archive those alarms, I can either wait for the execution time to take place and run the uh, action, or I have few action items available here. I have the execute, which will export these closed alarms to the database. I have the retry, which will retry the failed uh, exported alarms. And I have the import alarms, op import open alarms, which I'll show during the migration process. So I'll go ahead and execute the uh, process. I can see that last attempt is updated with the last success. I do not have any last failure. If I go back to the AX database maintenance view, I can see those cleared alarms are here, present here. And if I go back to the alarm service view of AX database maintenance of the alarm service and refresh it, I see all those cleared alarms are moved now. So this is these alarms are in my local system, in the local storage space, and the cleared alarms here are in my database and I can still see them. Similarly, if I go to the alarm scope, I can see the active alarms here. And in the alarm archive scope, I have the cleared alarms. And I can still see all the details are present here. They are the same as how they were present in the alarm space. So it's a seamless transition. Uh, all the functionalities are still maintained and we can work along with the cleared space and we can uh, still handle them in the same way we handle the open alarms. This was how we used the provider to export our cleared alarms from the station to the uh, database. Now I'll show the migration process. I have another station here, which uh, I have created for the uh, import demo. So in this station, uh, I do not have the alarm service. This station uses the Orion service and the Orion alarm service to capture the uh, alarms and route them to the database directly. So I do have the SQL Server database uh, connected with the Orion alarm service here. Uh, if you go into the property sheet, the database points it to the SQL Server database. So to convert this station to a station which uses alarm service along with the Orion archive alarm provider, we first need to add the alarm service to the station. 
So from the palette, we can directly add the alarm service under the services. And uh, we need to replicate the same structure as the Oran alarm service, uh, similar classes and the recipients. So it is advised to do this under uh, in the offline mode too. So we can quickly get the console recipient for the demo purpose and route our default alarm class to it. And uh, similar to the first part, we can drag and drop the Orion archive alarm provider under the alarm service. The next step is to configure this. Uh, by default, it's disabled. We enable it and route it to the SQL Server database. Now, once the setup is similar to our Orion alarm service, we can remove the Orion alarm service. And for the new changes to take place, we can restart the station. So my station is up now. I can see that the alarm archive scope is back under the alarm and my view on the provider is updated to the detail based maintenance view directly. So it means my configuration is working fine now and all these, uh, st all the alarms that I generate now will be routed through the alarm service and I can use the provider to export them to the uh, DB directly, or based on the execution time, they will be cleared at the defined time. Uh, in case we have any existing uh, alarms in the uh, database, we can run the import open alarms, and that will fetch all the open alarms from the database to my console recipient and back to the alarm service. So at this point, alarm service will not have any uh, records under it. All the records will be under the provider. I can, uh, the, all the points generated or all the alarms that were transferred to the database through the alarm Orion will become under here. So this will be a mix of active alarms and the closed alarms. And we can run the import open alarms to import those alarms back to the alarm service for processing. So that finishes the migration process. With archive alarm provider, we can optimize our local storage space for alarms with the same control as we have on the alarm service. It's a seamless transition with consistent view and feel. And it solves the network dependency problem too that Chris mentioned earlier. And as, as always, it's we have the public API available, which Niagara developers are welcome to build on top of it. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over back to the Chris to know more about this feature. Yeah, thank you so much, Ash. Josh. It was a great presentation. Uh, so what we had there were, you know, two examples. One, if you want to start using it, you know, fresh out of the box, how to set it up, how to get going. The second being uh, a scenario where your customer is already using the Orion alarm service, uh, but may like this scenario a little bit better and would like to migrate over to this scenario. Um, they're all different applications. They all have different um, uh abilities. So it's about, you know, finding what the one that's best for your customer situation and, and allowing them to uh, uh, work with that. So great, great presentation. Uh, so let's talk about a, a little about how this is licensed. Um, so there'll be a feature required in order to use the Orion archive alarm provider. So you, you can't, you can drop it into your station, but it's not going to do anything unless you're licensed as the feature. It's, and the feature will be called Alarm Archive. And you're gonna find this feature added to the RDB drivers. And, and it makes sense to do this because you can't utilize this at all unless you're adding, already have or are adding an RDB network um, and a connection to an RDB to your supervisor.
So let's wrap it up and get to the Q and A. We'll always like to end these uh, trading room talks with just um, um, some good information about further resources and materials. Uh, we we have Tritium University, great website with lots of good content, uh, both things you pay, things that are free, different levels for uh, different experiences. Um, a lot of times you'll find some feature, new feature tutorials there as well. So uh, I encourage people to go to the site. You, you join it by having a Niagara community account. Your Niagara community account is what's going to get you into community. Uh, for those who don't know, that's the our, our forum, so to speak, location for uh, you know communicating to both uh, us developers uh, here at Tritium as well as uh, uh, the community at large. Uh, but you will use that same account to get into the Tritium University uh, website. Uh, question, which I think I already I saw kind of come in, um, where can I find more Tritium talks? So this, this is being recorded. Once we're all finished, we're going to post it onto the website. You go to tritium.com, click on services and support, and click on events. And from there, there's a there'll be a drop down where you can um, see an upcoming event if, if one was uh, on the way, or to change it to see the past events, and you will find all of the Tritium talks. So um, but we want people to you know be able to not only you know view this at their own time, but more importantly, you maybe you see this and you think this is great. I can't wait to put this in on my customer site, and then you're not going to touch it for you know five months, or that that time won't come until another five months from now. Uh, you can just pull up this video the night before just to refresh your memory about how to set it up or, uh, you know, before a sales pitch where you're trying to, you know, introduce it to a, a customer and, and, you know, show them the offering to, to leverage them to buy it. And we also, we, we have our YouTube stars, James Johnson, Kevin Mamajek, for those uh, in the most people in the community know who these two are um, for the you know, the newcomers. Uh, these are veteran Niagara users, power users. They have a great YouTube channel where they post a lot of content on the YouTube channel. Um, they'll highlight different um, different things you can do, not just features, but maybe uh, different ways to go about using a feature or best practices. And finally, we get to the Q&A where we'll bring in Blake to help us uh, field some of the questions. Yeah, we've had some great questions come in over Q&A. Uh, one thing I would like to remind everyone about is that you know, Ashutosh gave a great demo of walking you through the steps to migrate to the Alarm Archive provider. And those steps are also covered in our user documentation if you prefer reading about it rather than rewatching the recording of this video. Um, so a couple of questions for you, Ashutosh. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we can query alarms out of our archive provider? For example, could I run a BQL query and get that alarm data back from our archive provider? Yes, uh, we have maintained the same functionality across alarm space and the alarm archive space. So users will be able to BQL the, or query the uh, alarm archive space. Uh, if you see the at the top root, we have the alarm space and alarm archive under it. Uh, if we see the odd there, we'll get the uh, annotation required for the alarm archive space. I guess it's uh, alarm archive. Uh, we have also covered this under our documentation. Great, and a couple of questions about a database support. Uh, which databases are supported via the archive alarm provider? Currently, we support uh, relational databases such as MySQL Server, uh, MS SQL Server, Oracle Database. Okay, so MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, and Oracle. Yeah, and just to follow up with that, um, there is some uh, interest sometimes in other RDBs, and I really encourage people to get in touch with their uh, account managers. Um, or get on the Niagara community website and, and talk about it. Um, that, that's how we help uh, decide what to work on next. Um, maybe we have to gauge the interest of the community at large. Um, and so when enough people are really interested in something in particular, we're, we're happy to pick it up and start working on it. All right, well, thank you, Ashutosh and Chris. We have no more questions in our Q&A at the moment, but uh, certainly if people 
think of any after you know, reviewing this video or playing around with this new feature later, they are welcome to contact us and we'll get you answers to those questions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. And then thank you, Blake. Thank you, Ashutosh. Great presentation. Uh, I want to thank the audience again for joining us. And uh, as Blake said, yeah, get, get on the community and reach out to us. Um, if you have questions, we're, we'll be on there and happy to answer it. And uh, uh, thanks again for joining us. Hope you all have a great day.